This is the first time I've ever climbed to the top of a minaret. The view is absolutely spectacular, but the climb is very steep. This is where the Mulgi calls the faithful to prayer five times a day. Let's just listen to him for a moment. He's saying, Allah Akbar, God is great. We are on the top of Mount Tabor and looking down here you can see beyond the line of trees the plain of Jezreel and in the background the mountains of Gilboa. Now this was the scene for a very remarkable battle which was fought between King Saul and the Israelites on one side, they were on the mountains of Gilboa, and the Philistines who were over in this direction. Saul was naturally anxious about the outcome of this battle and so he made some inquiries from God hoping to get some direction or some answer, some assurance. And so we are told here that he asked of the Lord in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 6, Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. Now that's a bit strange, isn't it? Because most people think all you've got to do is pray and God will give you an answer. But it says the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So you might think, well, that's a bit tough when a man prays and God doesn't answer him. But there was a good reason for this, you see. We are told here, then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Now, Endor is down at the foot of this mountain. Now, you see, the reason that God hadn't answered him was because he was living in disobedience to God. And you can't expect God to answer you or do anything for you if you're living in direct violation of his known will. And so now... Saul decides that he'll go to this medium at Endor. Now, this is the first recorded spiritualistic seance in history. And so here's Saul going off to this spiritualistic medium. And so away he goes. So Saul disguised himself, put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. So this is a real seance, you see, a spiritualistic medium and everything. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Now, you see, God had given specific instructions that mediums were not to function. They were to be put away. And here was Saul going to the very person who was condemned by God. However, Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? You notice it wasn't bringing down, but bringing up. And that's not a good place to come from, is it? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. Now, Samuel was the prophet. But we're distinctly told in verse 3, now Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah. So Samuel was dead and buried. And we've already noticed in a previous program that the dead know not anything. And yet here was Saul wanting to speak to Samuel who was dead and could not communicate with him. Well, did anything happen? Yes, it did. Because it says, he, he said to her, what is this form? You see, something came up, seemed to come up out of the ground. And he said, what is this form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. 
And then it says, Samuel said to Saul, and goes on to say what the conversation was. Now, here was an apparent conversation between Saul and the dead Samuel. Now, how are you going to explain that? If the Bible says that Saul had inquired of Samuel and that Samuel was dead, you can take it that Samuel was dead. It was not Samuel. Who was it then? The Bible teaches that the devil is a very real person and he has a lot of ability. He has the ability to impersonate the dead. He has the ability to take off the same sort of voice and mannerisms so that when Saul saw this figure or heard this voice, he thought, that's Samuel for sure, but it wasn't. I'll tell you, it was the devil impersonating Samuel. So the devil is a very real person. And when Jesus Christ was tempted in the devil, of the devil in the wilderness of Judea, it was a very real and personal devil that appeared to him. From the wilderness of Judea, the devil whisked Jesus up to Jerusalem, to the temple. You know, you never want to underestimate what the devil can do. It's incredible when God allows just what power the devil has and what he can do. And so he brought Jesus up here to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, if you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here, because it is written, He shall give His angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. You know, it's incredible. Even the devil knows how to quote Scripture when it suits him. But Jesus came back with another Scripture. He said, It is also written, You shall not test or tempt the Lord your God. That's the best way to beat the devil, you know. Just use the Bible. For the third temptation, the Bible says, Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now we don't know just exactly which mountain this was, but in front of you there is the traditional Mount of Temptation. And on the side, clinging to the side of the mountain, you can see is a Greek monastery. And that's where we're going to go now. From up here, I have a magnificent view looking out over the Jordan Valley and Jericho. And this conflict was a very real thing. Matthew 4, 9 says, The devil said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, this wasn't any make-believe. It really happened. There was Jesus Christ confronted by the devil in person. Well, now, you might say, well, where did this fellow come from? And why didn't God blot him out if he's giving so much trouble? We need to understand the issues behind this conflict. You see, God has a big, big universe. In Revelation chapter 5 and in verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. <laughs> well, you've got a little pocket calculator there that you can figure that out. Work it out. You'll find that we're talking about a hundred million angels, and then thousands of thousands besides that. A lot of angels. And the Bible says that one-third of the angels rebelled against God. Now, if there's a hundred thousand left, that means that there must have originally been at least a hundred and fifty thousand uh, millions, and so you've got a figure here of some 50 million devils at least that have rebelled against God. Now these were pure and holy angels who decided to rebel against the Creator. Well, how did it all begin? How did it get started? We are told in Isaiah chapter 14 where it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, apparently, Lucifer was the head angel, and he rebelled against God. 
There is no reason. You say, why did he do it? Wasn't he contented? He should have been. There's no reason you can give. Otherwise, you'd justify him doing it. But for some reason that we do not understand, he just said, well, I'm not satisfied with what I've got. And so he said, I want to be like the Most High. And so he rebelled against God. Now, he was a very beautiful angel. In the book of Ezekiel, it says here, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Now, that's apparently symbolic of this rebellion because it says here, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You see, the king of Tyre wasn't in the garden of God, in the garden of Eden. So it must be referring to this head angel, Lucifer. You were the anointed cherub who covers. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity found, was found in you. Oh, so you see, he was created. He wasn't a, a born creature, he was created. And so this beautiful angel apparently became filled with pride and decided to rebel against God. Well, apparently he was very subtle and succeeded in getting a lot of the angels to sympathize with him. And what was the result? Well, there was only one conclusion that could happen. And that's brought to light in Revelation 12 and in verse 7 where it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, why didn't the Lord destroy him? You see, he was apparently very subtle, and if God had wiped him out there and then, there may have been some lingering questions in the minds of the loyal angels. And so God had to let this controversy develop just to see where it was really leading to. I think we can see it now. Well, what was the result of all this? What was the result of these angels being cast out? Do you see that cave in the hillside up there? I want to tell you an interesting story. Uh, we're actually standing here at a place called Kursi, and it is thought that that was the ancient Gerasa. Now, in the Bible, we read a story about two men who came from Gerasa, or actually the biblical record in some manuscripts says the Gadarenes. Well, this is what happened. Uh, over there is the Lake of Galilee, and one morning Jesus came, arrived here in his boat with the disciples, and no sooner had they landed than two demon-possessed men came running down from these caves and approached Jesus and the disciples. And the disciples apparently were scared to death. They fled. But not Jesus. He stood his ground. And so when they approached him, all fierce and threatening, Jesus simply commanded the devils to go out of them. And the devil put up some resistance. These were demon-possessed men, you see. And it says in Luke chapter 8, Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, legion, because many demons had entered into him. Now, we need to realize there's an awful lot of devils around this world. There are millions of them. In fact, you've probably got one in personal attendance on yourself, so you need to be on your guard. And so these people said they were legion. There were many devils. And so Jesus cast out these demons. And these men were so grateful, they just flung themselves at Jesus' feet. The next thing we have the record of is they were sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in their right minds. That's what Jesus can do for demon-possessed people. And demon possession is a very real thing. It really happens. And don't make any mistake, these demons have some real power. For instance, in Revelation chapter 16, and in verse 14 it says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs, or miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You see, the devil can work miracles, and all his evil angels can work miracles. So just because you see a miracle, don't jump to the conclusion that it must be of God. The devil and his evil angels are out to deceive people, and they have the power to perform miracles. And even pre people who preach in their name have the power to w work miracles, even in the name of Christ, although they're actually serving the devil. Listen, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now here are people who actually call Christ Lord. And yet it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it's not a case of whether you work miracles or not. It's a case of whether you do the will of God. Now, I want to take it a step further. Do you realize that there are spiritualist churches in the world today? That is, churches that claim to believe in the Bible, claim to believe in Jesus Christ, and yet they have seances, they have mediums, they have spirits appearing out of the darkness and all the rest of it. And these spirits profess to have faith in Christ. They profess to be the spirits of people who have died, and yet they have faith in Christ. Listen, this just does not work. It's absolutely contrary to the Bible. It just can't be. And it just must be that it's the devil impersonating those who are departed and who are trying to make out that they're still alive. It's a false sense of security. And there are just millions of people being swept into this. I don't know whether you noticed this a few years ago in the Time magazine. Do you see what it says here? The occult revival. Down the bottom here, Satan returns. You know, even the Time magazine gets it right sometimes. And uh, they're spot on there. And so there is a great revival of the occult, Satanism, and these spirits appearing to people. And so if you haven't had any confrontation with this sort of thing yet, well, just know what it's all about because you might be called upon to face up to something like this. The Bible makes it very plain that we ought to keep right away from this sort of thing. Listen, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 8 and in verse 19. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Isn't that just what they're doing? Seeking the supposedly dead on behalf of the living. And they're not talking to the dead at all. They're in communication with evil spirits. Now, this is what it says. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, some people think, well, there's a bit of light here. Listen, if it's darkness, there is no light in them. And it's dangerous. And if you are involved in this sort of thing in any way, I want to advise you to get right out of it. It's dangerous. Keep away from it altogether. Well, some people might be disappointed in this. Actually, I, I guess I should tell you that my, mother, my grandmother was a spiritualist. She had a weekly seance, went along and talked to her so-called dead husband once a week. So I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. But I want to tell you it's dangerous and keep away from it. There is a marvelous alternative. Listen, Jesus said in John 10 and in verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Look, if you want life, there's the place to get it from Jesus Christ. Don't go looking to it for it in dead people. Jesus Christ is the one who is able to give you life, real good, wonderful life in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Standing here in the ruins of Gerasa, where those demon-possessed men might have come from, gives one quite an eerie feeling. Have you ever wondered why God gave such specific instructions regarding the building of the sanctuary? And why he required so many animal sacrifices? Why would a God of love need to be placated by the death of so many animals? We'll explain and answer these puzzling questions in our next program when we visit Shiloh, where the Israelites first erected the sanctuary when they arrived in the Promised Land.